What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Tonight, it's just me. We are talking about the Westfield Watcher. Next week, Stefan will be back, and let's go ahead and get into it. When the Broaddus family of five purchased their dream home in upscale Westfield, New Jersey in 2014, they were unaware that it already had a tenant of sorts. An individual calling themselves the Watcher began communicating with the family through a series of letters that became progressively more disturbing. Derek and Maria Broaddus, along with their three children, were an average upper middle class family who thought they were purchasing their dream home when they bought a spacious five bedroom home at 657 Boulevard in the posh suburb of Westfield, New Jersey. It was where Maria had enjoyed an idyllic childhood and what they got instead turned into a nightmare for the family, both financially and emotionally. The house at 657 Boulevard was originally constructed in 1905 and was due for a little remodeling before it would be ready for the family to move in. A small army of contractors got to work almost immediately after they closed on the home. The home was also only a few blocks away from the home that Maria grew up in. Derek, on the other hand, grew up in Maine and had worked his way up the corporate ladder to become the senior vice president of an insurance company. He had a very large salary and it was certainly enough to afford the $1.3 million home. Now, the day this all started, Derek was at the house to do a little bit of painting and paused to retrieve the mail before leaving. Inside the mailbox, among the typical mail, was a handwritten envelope with a letter inside. It was signed only as The Watcher. Described as written in thick ink, part of the first letter stated, quote, 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and it approaches its 110th birthday. I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 1960s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. End quote. This was only the beginning of years worth of letters and torment that would come down upon the family. The letters began to describe in great detail what was happening in the house and who the family was. The letters described the workers inside the house, stating, quote, I see already that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be. Tsk, tsk, tsk. Bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. End quote. Now, remember at this point, they still haven't moved into the house. They're still doing work on the house, getting ready to move in, and one day, the family went to the house while work was happening to try and make friends with the neighbors. And of course, they brought their children. The Broaddus children were 5, 8, and 10 years old and were playing in the backyard with the neighborhood kids that day. Soon after, another letter came to the house stating, quote, You have children. I have seen them. So far, I think there are three that I have counted. End quote. It went on to say, quote, Do you need to fill the house with young blood, I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for the growing family? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Will the young blood play in the basement, or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out the many windows in 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by every day. Maybe I am one, end quote. The letter concluded with a suggestion that this message would not be the last. In fact, it ends like this, quote, welcome my friends, welcome, let the party begin, end quote. And then it was signed in a cursive font, just the watcher. So obviously the letters really freaked Derek and Maria out. Derek contacted John and Andrea Woods via email, who sold them the home. They said that they had never received anything like that in the 23 years they lived there, until just a few days before they were going to move out. They said they received a letter similar to the ones the Broaddus family had received, but they thought it was so weird they threw it out without thinking much of it. The same day, the Broaddus family took the letter to Detective Leonardo Lugo, who told them to not tell anyone about it, including their new neighbors, as they all could be suspects. Two weeks after the first letters arrived, Maria stopped back by the house to do some more work and check the mail. She instantly noticed the letter with the thick black lettering on the envelope and called the police. The letter read, quote, Welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The workers have been busy, and I have been watching you unload cartfuls of your personal belongings. The dumpster is a nice touch. Have they found what is in the walls yet? In time, they will, unquote. 
Also in the letter, the Watcher addressed the Broaddus family by name, although misspelling their name. They also boasted about the fact that they had been watching the house so much and finding out everything they can about the family. And the letter identified the birth order of all of their children and their nicknames. Quote, I am pleased to know your names now in the name of the young blood you have brought to me. You certainly say their names often, end quote. The letter asked about one child in particular, whom the letter had seen using an easel outside on the enclosed porch. Quote, is she the artist in the family? And this is really when it gets very strange. At first, you can just kind of say, maybe it's just someone messing with us. But as the letters progress, it gets creepier and creepier, and I can understand why they would be very scared. So I'm going to finish reading what we know about that particular letter. Quote, Will they sleep in the attic, or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. That will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the watcher, and I've been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on and kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, and my obsession. And now you are too, Broaddus family. Welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard, and now it has brought you to me. Have a happy day moving in. You would know I will be watching. Because of that letter, the Broaddus family had the walls checked to see if there was indeed something lurking within. Uh, but despite hiring a professional firm to peer into the hidden recesses of the walls, nothing was found. At this point, Derek and Maria decided to postpone their plans to move into the house with the children and instead went to go stay with relatives, uh, Maria's parents, while they tried to figure out how to proceed. They decided that no matter how small the risk, they couldn't stake the well-being of their children on such a gamble. Now at this point, Derek becomes obsessed with finding out who it was and what was happening, and something I could see myself doing in his shoes, of course. He set up webcams all around the house and spent multiple nights sitting outside in the dark, hidden by bushes to try and find the person. Maria was calling him crazy, but this is something he felt like he had to do. He started researching who his neighbors were and when they moved in. He found out that the only neighbors that had been there for a long time were the Langfords. They had lived in a house near since the 1960s. He had a map of all the houses and who lived in them, and it also showed the overlays, I guess he created, were possible sight lines to the house and an approximate range of earshot to be able to estimate who may have heard Maria yelling their kids' names. The family hired former FBI agent Robert Leahan, who performed a threat assessment on the letters. His analysis of the letters indicated that the individual was likely older based on the vocabulary used in the writer's habit of double spacing after a period. But as to the actual threat that the letters posed to the family, Robert could not say, as while the letters were not overtly threatening, the erratic thinking contained in the letters did suggest a level of unpredictability. Robert also ran a DNA test on one of the envelopes that had been licked shut, and it contained saliva that belonged to a woman, but that person has not been identified. A search for fingerprints on the envelopes and letters yielded nothing of value. The family also hired a security firm to search for handwriting matches, but none were found. Showing the handwriting to the neighbors in hopes of someone being able to recognize the author also was unsuccessful. Also unsuccessful were the efforts of a forensic linguist who was tasked with searching online forums for language patterns that were similar to the ones used in the letters. Another letter that later arrived read, quote, The house is crying from all the pain it is going through. You have changed it and made it too fancy. You were stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be in time when I roamed its halls. The 1960s were a good time for 657 Boulevard when I ran room to room imagining the life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then it got too old and so did my father. But he kept watching it until the day he died. And now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again." End quote. After all this investigation, nothing really came up. Derek was still looking at the Langfords with great detail, however, and with permission from the police department, he sent a letter to the Langfords telling them the plans that they had for tearing down the house to see if they would get a response, but they didn't. Detective Lugo brought in Michael Langford for questioning twice during this entire ordeal. Michael was one of the younger family members in the Langford house. Derek suspected him from the very beginning, but nothing came from the interviews with him. It even got to the point where both families met with their respective lawyers present 
so that Derek could show them the evidence that he had, which was the map and all of the crazy stuff he put on the map. And the Langfords obviously professed their innocence and Derek didn't have anything really hard uh, against them. So of course it seems like the Langfords are just being uh, targeted by Derek and Maria and the family in general, and they're claiming they had nothing to do with it. So real quick, let's go into the history of the home. The home at 657 Boulevard uh, it has a pretty mysterious history. It is sold multiple times for the cost of $1. It was the only sale by the Woods to the Broaddus family uh, for more than $1. In fact, the home sold in 2014 to the Broaddus family for $1.3 million. But here's the history of ownership since 1905. In 1913, a William H. Davies purchased the property for $1. He would later become Westfield's mayor. Davies sold the home in 1947 to his son and daughter-in-law for the price of $1 which is not particularly unusual among, you know, amongst family members. The son then turned around and sold the home to Dillard and Mary Bird in 1951, again for just $1. And there is no evidence that the Davies' son was related to the Birds. In keeping with tradition, the Birds sold the home to a family named the Blakes in 1953 for, again, just $1. The Blakes then turned right around and sold the home to the Schaefers in 1955 for $1. The Schaefers remained in the home until 1990 when it was bought by the Woods. No information is available on the price that the Woods paid for the home, but it is known that the Woods retained ownership until the Broaddus family bought it for $1.3 million. So someone at some point, either the Woods or the Schaefers, made a butt ton of money on this house. I mean, someone bought it for a dollar and sold it. It was either the Woods for $1.3 or the Schaefers because we don't know exactly how much they sold it to the Woods for. But someone made a lot of money off that house at some point. Now, the investigation had stalled by this point, and what were they to do? They sold their old home and were living with Maria's family while the construction was going on at the new home. And construction was done within a few months, and they were supposed to move in, but how could they? They were afraid for their children's safety, as you should be in this case. They had extreme anxiety about moving in, and six months after everything began, they decided to try and sell the house. However, because the house had now been sitting for so long, Rumors began to circle about why and what was wrong with the home. They ended up telling their realtors about the letters, although only partially, and that anyone that bought the home could see the letters before buying it. They lowered the price multiple times, but no one was willing to buy. The realtor actually told them that they were being too forthcoming about the letters to potential buyers, but the family responded that they couldn't sell the house to some unsuspecting family without disclosing it first. Now in a strange turn of circumstances, the Broaddus family decided to sue the Woods family, the couple who had sold them the house. They thought that the Woods should have disclosed the letter they received before moving out. The Broaddus family was hoping for a small settlement from the Woods family, but the Woods responded by saying that they didn't take it seriously at all, and they, they had thrown the letter away, and they had never even thought anything like this could happen, and they thought the letter that they had received was mostly a prank. And now, we don't know how long the Woods have been dealing with this, if it truly was just one letter or if they had actually been dealing with it for a while. It seems unlikely that they've been receiving letters for a long time and never said anything, uh, but yeah. But because of this, what happened next would escalate things in a different way. A local reporter learned about the complaint against the Woods and the complaint contained snippets of the letters. Once published, the story went viral and every news station had news vans parked outside the house. The family received over 300 media requests. They decided not to speak to the media. With this story receiving such widespread attention now, it also came to the attention of Baron Chambliss, a veteran detective in Westfield Police Department, and he was asked to look into the case. He knew that the Langfields had already been looked at, and he knew that Michael had been diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was younger. There were reports that Michael had been doing weird things for years, including peeking into windows of neighbors' houses, and walking through backyards. With that said, others have claimed that Michael was an incredibly polite, nice man who helped neighbors out with chores uh, and that sort of thing, and he was not capable of writing the letters. Eventually, with more investigation and nothing coming up, the police department once again came to the conclusion that there wasn't enough evidence to tie the Langfords to the letters. Now, after all of this, they didn't know what to do with this house. It wasn't selling, and the realtor came up with an idea to sell the house to a developer, who would then tear down the house and split the property into two homes that they could then sell. They believed they could probably get $1 million for the lot. Kind of seems high, but I don't know. However, when they started to plan this, 
they realized that when the lot was divided, each smaller lot was three feet too small for the required zoning regulations. With this news, they would have to go before the Westfield Planning Board to be granted an exception to this. As it was only three feet, and this was such a public story by now, they thought they would be granted the exception. Over 100 people came to this hearing, which is unusual for a planning board hearing, I think, and they showed up just to show that they didn't like the idea of this plot being split up. They didn't like the way it would make the neighborhood look. They thought the house was beautiful in general. They just didn't like it. And a lot of other plots had been having this done to them in the past, and they were just kind of tired of it. But after four hours, almost midnight that night, the planning board rejected the proposal, and the family seemingly was back to square one. However, soon after the proposal was rejected, the family did receive some good news. A family that had two big dogs and grown children decided that they wanted to rent the house and they didn't care about the watchers, supposedly. But they did have a clause in the agreement that they could leave if they ever received another letter. But within two weeks of moving in, that letter arrived. It read, quote, Violent winds and bitter cold. To the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife, Maria. You wonder who the watcher is? Turn around, idiots. Maybe you even spoke to me one of the so-called neighbors who has no idea who the watcher could be. Or maybe you do know and are too scared to tell anyone. Good move. Maybe a car accident. Maybe a fire. Maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away but makes you fell sick day after day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet. Loved ones suddenly die. Planes and cars and bicycles crash. Bones break. 657 Boulevard survived your attempted assault and stood strong with its army of supporters barricading its gates. My soldiers of the Boulevard followed my orders to a T. They carried out their mission and saved the soul of 657 Boulevard with my orders. All hail the Watcher, end quote. Now, this one's a bit different. Before, while he was very threat, he was, he was threatening, now he's, he's, telling people that he's going to crash planes and cars and break bones and he's going to make people very ill and possibly they'll die. So it's gone a little bit further. Kind of sounds like some weird edgy kid is writing this at this point. Uh, he even calls Maria a winch of a wife. So anyways, but with that letter, as you can probably guess, the family that was renting the house would end up moving out of the house. So there are a lot of theories about exactly who's writing the letters and what was happening. But when the Woods placed the home on the market in 2014, they received multiple competing offers that exceeded their asking price. Another theory suggests that the writer could be someone who lost the house in the bidding war and was holding a grudge because of it. Andrea Woods shared with the Broadduses the information she had gleaned about the other bidders and said that one had health problems that prevented the purchase of the property and another had found a different home to purchase. So neither seemed like an unstable personality and neither exhibited any unusual behavior. So I don't know, you know, how much you can really look at this theory. So there's another suggestion for a theory. And I think this one, from what I've seen online, is actually pretty popular. Uh, but it's that the Broadduses concocted the whole scenario when they found themselves unable to afford the pricey renovations or just the house in general. Citing the relatively low cost of the home they purchased prior to buying 657 Boulevard, which cost them $300,000 with a mortgage of just one seventy-five. dollars one resident speculated in an article that they were unable to afford the $1.1 million mortgage for the new home and were sending the letters to themselves to get out of the deal. I don't really buy into this very much. I mean, Derek had a really well-paying job. It definitely seems like they could afford the house, uh, so maybe they were doing it for another reason. Uh, but, you know, Derek has shared that he is unable to sleep at night and is now on medication to help him sleep and cope with the stress of the situation. Maria began seeing a therapist who diagnosed her with PTSD, and their marriage went through many upheavals due to the tremendous stress, and it was reported that the couple stood at the brink of divorce on more than one occasion, which is understandable. Also, it seems odd that they would do this themselves when they have, you know, three children, the youngest being five years old. I mean, that's, yeah. And, and in fact, this whole case kind of makes me mad because there's a five-year-old in the house. I have a five-year-old. It's just scary thinking about someone sending letters and stalking the family when you have a five-year-old. Others have speculated that the watcher is a sexual predator who gets his kicks by terrorizing the family and the resulting publicity and news articles that the incident has generated. And you know, it moved from a, a local matter of interest to the national stage. However, 
Again, it should be noted that there's no real hard evidence to support this and, and pretty much any of the online theories that have come about since, since this story happened. Now, something else came to light in the later years. The watcher had targeted another house on the same block as 657 Boulevard. The family targeted had lived on the street for many years and had received a very similar letter to the ones received by the Broadduses, and it was sent at around the same time the Broadduses received their first letter. Thinking it was just a prank, the second family threw away the letter, but one of their grown children posted about it on Facebook where it came to the attention of investigators. Given this new information, police conducted a stakeout on the boulevard where they could keep tabs on both houses that had been targeted. One evening, a car parked nearby attracted their attention, so they traced the vehicle to a young woman that lived in an adjacent town but who had a boyfriend who lived on the same block as the two targeted houses. The boyfriend, quote, had a keen interest in dark video games. One of them was titled The Watcher, end quote. Investigators twice invited the boyfriend to come out to the police station for an interview, and twice he agreed to an appointment only to fail both times. He remains a person of interest, but the police just don't have enough evidence to compel him to speak with them um, or to obtain a search warrant. And without this further evidence, the case continues to grow cold. It seems like this mystery is destined to remain a cold case forever. Uh, they were able to rent out the house for a while, but the rent didn't pay the mortgage. However, in August of 2019, the property at 657 Boulevard was sold to an unidentified individual for $959,000 somewhat below the listed price, considering the many renovations performed by the Broadduses. However, given everything that had happened, the life-changing ordeal, I'm sure they considered it a bargain. And the new owners have received a full disclosure on the property and its history, going through with the sale with their eyes wide open. You know what I think? I think it was all conducted by this person who wanted to buy the house for cheaper. Because, okay, I'm joking, but the Broadduses bought it for 1.3 million, they put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this house, and now they sold it for 959000 